Hey everyone, welcome to Redefining HR. I'm your host, Laura Schmidt, and today I'm really excited to be joined by Lene Luque. Lene is the Chief People Officer at NerdWallet, and we have so much to cover, so let's jump right in. Um, Lene, I'd love to have you start off with an introduction for the audience. Yeah, so as you said, my name is Lene, Chief People Officer at NerdWallet. I've been in this role about two years, two years in a couple of weeks now. Uh, I've been in HR since 2008 and haven't looked back. I made a career switch in 2008, haven't looked back. And what I love is partnering with executives, managers, all the way down to individual contributors to just make the business more productive and make sure we have trust and an inclusive environment yeah. in the workplace. And, you know, I always kind of start at the beginning. And as you mentioned, you had a pivot into HR. You started your career in, in finance and consulting before making that pivot. Go back in time. Uh, was, yeah. <laughs> was that a conscious shift? Were you thinking like, hey, this, this HR thing is for me? Like, how did you end up making that shift? Yeah, I 100% made a conscious shift. And I say that because I have so many people on my teams that say they fell into HR, like, oh, I fell into HR and I really enjoyed it. Um, I definitely put a lot of effort <laughs> to switch into HR. But this goes back to when I was declaring my major in undergrad, I really wanted to do psychology or sociology, but I was an impressionable 18 year old. My older brother was the first person who went to college and he went to the same college as me. And he gave me advice that what I wanted after graduating was a job, a very practical job. And so he said, I recommend you major in business, in finance, in accounting, because you'll always be employable. And at 18, I was like, jobs are good. I really <laughs> like uh, stability and money. I will do this. So I did it for six years. I loved the team dynamic. I love interacting, interfacing with clients. I was not in love with the content that I was dealing with every day. And after that time period where I felt I can have a job, like no matter what, even if I switched careers, I could always come back to this and feel stable. So it was after six years that I said, raise my hand, I'm going to quit this job. I went back to school and put all my effort into switching into HR. That happened in 2008, which feels like ages ago. <laughs> And I haven't looked back. And what I could say is I get all the same things that I liked, the team dynamic, the interfacing with different people every day. And the main difference is I actually like the content of the work. And I could listen to podcasts on the weekends about some of the topics we're dealing with. And uh, I just really appreciate that, that part of the career switch. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. I think when you look back on people's careers and I have the, you know, the, the benefit in, in this podcast of being able to talk to a lot of people about careers. And, and it, it's so common that I find that there's one particularly formative role um, at some point in kind of the first half of their career that really kind of set them on a path and a trajectory towards the role that they have now. And I think for you, you know, looking back at your experience at Twitter, you know, you, you were there during a period of, of hyper growth. Um, you had the opportunity to, uh, you know, you'll correct me here, but I think you had, you know, five roles in five years or something like that. You know, that typical startup trajectory where it's like, if you're smart and you're capable and you're flexible, uh, you can grow so much in, in an accelerated time frame. And so I'd love to kind of take you back to Twitter. Like when you look back on that experience, um, how did that experience kind of shape how you think about, uh, you know, HR and even more specifically, um, kind of people leadership. Yes. I think first things first is what I've learned about myself. And I didn't know this when I was like first entering my career. I know this now is I'm a builder. I am not the type of person who likes to sustain or, you know, do slow incremental progress. So I would say that to, to people is like, understand what environment and what type of situation you like to work in. And when I think about Twitter, it was, it was what I was seeking out and I just didn't know it at the time. Um, 
my dad's an entrepreneur. I'm my brothers took over the business. I've kind of like been raised around that scrappy entrepreneurial vibe. And for me, I don't necessarily want to start my own business right now, but I liked that vibe. So when I was introduced to some people at Twitter and then interviewed, I walked in and I was like, okay, this place is going somewhere, but I'm not sure they know exactly how to get there. It was that frenetic buzz walking into the building. My title was HRBP. There were no fancy titles. We didn't have levels, global levels yet. And what I learned during the interview process was we need help in lots of different ways and in lots of different parts of HR. So the main criteria is, you know, do you want to get your hands on a lot of different things and learn and grow with the business? And I was like, sign me up. Uh, I want to do that. So it fed into my builder mentality. There was so much to build. I also enjoy building from a a blank canvas. And there were plenty of blank canvases there. Uh, And my main lesson was stay flexible, stay agile. The company materially shifted and changed it every six months. So something that we put in place or we thought was a really great idea, it was almost old um, and not relevant anymore six months later. So you really had to stay in your toes Um, and stay kind of flexible and agile, um, as I said. And, you know, another great thing is I just met a lot of other builders there. When you have something that's growing and and isn't all done yet, you attract all types of people who want to be there and want to help it grow. And that network of builders has served me ever since, like served me at Twitter, served me after Twitter, served me until today. Um, yeah, I mean, looking back at the um, some of the alumni and the talent that was amassed there from a people leadership standpoint is just significant. I mean, a lot of people who've been former guests on the podcast, uh, you know, uh, Janet, who was the chief people officer, whose shoes over at Cloudflare now. I mean, she was incredible. Just assembled such a a pool of talent, and I think it's it's rare. Uh, looking back and looking across different organizations, there's a handful of companies and there's a handful of leaders who you can just tell incubate talent. When you follow the, you know, the family tree, if you will, from the leader, you can just see uh, the caliber of talent that they've attracted and developed who then gone on to have their own tremendous careers. And you said something there that I think is really important when you think about um, the work in startups, especially hyper growth startups. Um, In six months, things can become outdated. And so I, I think trying to be married to principles, not projects, is really important because projects have a shelf life and even initiatives have a shelf life and even great initiatives mm-hmm. will have a shelf life <laughs> in an environment like that. So if you get so locked in to those and aren't able to be agile and adaptive, um, you know, I think that's going to be, that's going to be a bit of a struggle, um, for you. So you, you, you know, again, had that kind of, uh, fast growth, uh, trajectory within Twitter. And then you moved on to your first, uh, chief people officer role at, uh, Envoy. And I'm curious, you know, because I think moving into that first role, that has its own challenges, right? Because you're seeing and doing a lot of things you've never seen and done before. But in your situation with Envoy, you had the additional challenge of being the first chief people officer who they had hired. And so that's kind of a double first scenario, right? Where I think (laughs) they don't really know what they need. You don't really know all the things that, you know, that you need to be doing in that role. What was that experience like for you? Yeah. Again, I, I sought that out. So about a year before I left Twitter, I started to think about what do I want to do next? Uh, because Twitter was a pretty exciting place. I think I could have done another six years and it would have flown by in a blink of, of an eye because things move so quickly and change so quickly. But I had a moment and I really wanted to own the whole, whole thing. That's what I said to myself. And I started talking to my mentors around, you know, what does that look like? If I wanted to be ahead of people, what environment do they think is best, et cetera, et cetera. And someone sat me down and they were like, I know you, Lene, you are a builder. You like building from scratch. So I would seek out a company that hasn't had a formal head of people or chief people officer before, because then 
you know that there won't be a lot of legacy systems and processes in place and you won't have to spend, you know, 50% or more of your time unraveling rather than getting to what you want to do, which is being creative, building, setting up the infrastructure that you want. So I was targeted. It could have been like this huge, you know, um, group of companies that I interviewed with, but instead I started targeting what are the smaller scale companies that have never had a head of people that I also thought aligned with my values and how I like to work. And so that's how I landed at Envoy. So I really thought of that first as a plus um, and something I wanted. Now, first time head of people, what I will, I will say is you don't know what you're signing up for until you actually get into <laughs> right. the role. Uh, and it, for a variety of reasons, right? Like an interview process can only tell you so much and only cover so much. And then going back to previous experiences, like I said, at that stage, the company is just shifting and changing at such a rapid pace that whatever you signed up for uh, when you first started isn't necessarily what is relevant, you know, six months to a year later. Um, so how I got through that part of it is leaning on my network. Uh, many times you are the subject matter expertise. You're the only one who does what you do in that startup. And most people, at least at Envoy, you know, over 50% of the people, Envoy at 90 people was the largest company they ever worked for. So you're not going to get a lot of like context and best practice uh, from them. So you really have to kind of like go outside uh, see what is relevant and then bring it back in and marry it with that business context and the cultural context. Um, so really what got me through that part was my network. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, as a, again, a first time head of people, especially in an environment like that, as you describe it, a lot of people who, you know, 90 was the largest company they were for your ability to build, um, trust and rapport to get that kind of a team to buy into people initiatives that they probably haven't seen or experienced before is, is really pivotal to your success. Like when you look back, were there, were there any things that worked particularly well or particularly not well for you in terms of being able to get, um, kind of support and buy into some of the people programs you were introducing likely many for the first time? Yeah, I would say there is a very tops down and bottoms up approach you have to take with any initiatives at a company that small and a company, you know, growing and changing that rapidly. Uh, you know, first principle for me is understanding the business, understanding where they're trying to go. And I call that executive alignment or leadership alignment. Um, I'd hate to throw out an idea and you have zero leadership alignment. Like, you know, that's not going to necessarily work. Uh, so kind of starting there, but also, at a company of that size, you know, any kind of change or initiative has an outsized impact, right? So it was also about just going down at the ground level and what are people trying to achieve? What kind of environment do they want to be in? So it was always this two-part process of gathering through my listening tours or my one-on-ones, informal and formal at the lunch table or in a, you know, conference room and marrying that with the understanding of what's going on in business and what are the leaders ready and comfortable with right now. That, that was kind of my approach and, and key to success. And even though something like nerd wallet where I'm at now is 750 people in many ways, I still apply that same approach at the, in this larger organization. Yeah. Well, let's talk about NerdWallet. So you you joined, uh, as you mentioned, about two years ago, um, kind of at the peak of the pandemic, which is always an interesting time to join uh, any organization. But you also joined a, a role specifically that had been vacant for two years, which has its own set of uh, complexity, we'll call it. Um, what was that experience like for you? Like coming into a role, obviously there had been a vacuum of leadership uh, at that level for a couple of years and you're coming in at probably one of the most difficult times that <laughs> any chief people officer had helping their organization navigate all that was happening in September of 2020. So like walk me back through that. What, what was that experience like for you? 
uh, that that is hard for any of us to go back to that time. <laughs> yeah, right? I mean, don't like, yeah, don't like put, don't immerse yourself back in that time. Yeah, I don't want to do yeah. that to you, but you know, just like dabble, dabble in those memories. Yeah, yeah, definitely. It was. I mean, honestly, it was crazier than I thought it was going to be. So, a couple of reasons is. I was, it was fully remote at that time. We were in the thick of the pandemic. All my interviews were remote. I met my now boss two times in my first year in the role. Uh, I would present via Zoom and there are cameras off. uh, We're a cameras off culture. So I don't see any faces back. It was like me talking into this void of folks. So I would say the first thing is, I pride myself in being able to get to know an organization, get to know people through connection. It could be Zoom connection, but it could also be in-person connection. So that tool was taken away from me. Usually I feel comfortable in the first 90 days and at Riverwood, it took about six months for me to feel just like personally comfortable and that I knew people and that I knew it was going on in the culture. So that was unexpected. Um, you know, hopefully we never have to do that again. <laughs> we, we never have to, to live through that again. But I think to the second part of your question, you know, I, I knew through the vetting process and the interview process that they had a, a set of people practices and a really good, strong culture at that time that had been set over years. Some of that through leadership that they had previously, and but they hadn't had that people leader, subject matter expert in a while. And it was one of the things that made me cautious about joining NerdWallet at first, uh, because coming in and changing and um, helping the culture shift is, isn't easy. Uh, it's also not easy if the organization hasn't really had practice in that in a while. Yeah. And it hadn't had practice in a while. It, it changed a little bit of how I approached my onboarding, uh, but, you know, ultimately, I feel really good two years later to bring it back to present and not, <laughs> not going back to the two years ago. Yeah. 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 It's interesting. I think when you walk in an environment, as you mentioned, they had some established kind of people, systems and practices and kind of cultural norms, um, you know, but there's something about obviously a role at that level, um, particularly at that time and, and certainly continues now, like there's there's so the the connection between the CEO and the chief people officer is one of the most important relationships in the C-suite and having that that confidant that they can rely on to help, you know, think through business challenges, not even just HR and people challenges, but business challenges and 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 things that are coming and you know, we've been hit with event after event after event uh, you know, since the pandemic over the last 2 years with that that relationship is just key. I mean, was there um, was there like a, a list of things that had kind of accumulated, almost like you talk about kind of people debt and <laughs> HR debt. Was there CPO debt when you came into that role that you had to, again, as you tweaked your onboarding process, you know, spend some of that time kind of navigating through that? There were definitely a list of things <laughs> that had been piled up and they were just waiting for someone to tackle it. Um, I will bring this back though, because I know, you know, some of the people that want to be in this role and want to work for a founder CEO, what I've learned over my time is getting clear and aligned during the interview process is so important. This isn't one of those roles and this isn't a relationship where it's like, let's figure it out when I get in there. Right. If I was joining as the head of people of Intel which is, you know, over 40 years, 100,000 people have great systems and processes, and you can almost kind of plug in to those systems and processes, totally fine. But when you're coming into this build situation with the founder CEO, get that alignment up front. And in our interview, I walked away, before I said yes, I walked away with the top three things that were on um, Tim's mind. So number one, he wanted to shift the company to a remote first culture. It had been in his mind for many years, but he never put a stick in the ground and he didn't know how to do it. Um, The pandemic was kind of that perfect opportunity. The next one was he wanted to integrate, formally integrate DEI, diversity, equity, inclusion in the company culture. He considered his culture good, healthy, inclusive, which it is, but he didn't have any formal programs around that. 
And third, he wanted to grow the company at a pace and a clip that he hadn't grown before and was looking for someone who had seen that type of growth before from the people perspective. So those things were super clear. They were written in my announcement when I joined. We, you know, I had them as part of my integration and onboarding plan. Um, and they were really kind of my North Star for that first year. And so I would I would encourage people. Uh, so if you're going into a position where there hasn't been someone for a while or that you have maybe a non-professional CEO that hasn't seen growth before as much as possible, try to get that clarity and that alignment up front. Um, we can make it much better experience for you uh, and for the entire company. Uh, but those were, those were kind of very clear now that I'm saying it to you, like very clear things. Not easy to execute on at all, um, but at least one part was, you know, clear. Yeah. Well, I think, you know, when you, you, you mentioned something kind of working for a founder CEO and a, you know, non-professional CEO, you've done that twice. Uh, you know, now your last two roles were both, uh, you know, working with and reporting to founder CEOs and reporting to founder CEO is, is different, uh, than again, reporting to a professional CEO who, you know, has done that multiple times over. They kind of understand the dynamics They're They're maybe, uh, maybe somewhat more dispassionate about the product or the business because it's not something that they created themselves and that's not a knock on them, but they just, they bring a different skill set to the role than, than a founder CEO often will. What advice might you have for, for heads of people who are reporting to a founder CEO for the first time? Are, are there things that maybe they should know about that dynamic or ways that they can think about, um, you know, optimizing that relationship, you know, based on, on the, your experience with kind of the profile of somebody uh, who's coming it from the founder CEO standpoint? Yeah. And it's actually my third time because of those many roles that I had at Twitter, one of them was head of HR for Vine. Oh, so yeah. it was an acquisition that we did and we decided to keep it intact. And, um, I just had to flex my role at the time and also take on head of HR there. So I was able to work with those three co-founders as they kind of built and scaled the business inside, uh, of Twitter, you know, number one, it, it really, it's my preference. Like you have to understand your preferences on who you want to work with. And what I found is good for me is to be connected to someone who is really deeply connected to the mission and the vision of the company and who better than the founder. Like they started this, they were pitching this when nobody believed in it. And there's a different type of just attachment and passion that you can get from a leader and it's inspiring to me. It can also be a great tool to inspire uh, groups of people like all of the employees that we have. So, you know, I appreciate that. I like that. I think when it comes to um, getting our people agenda done, though, I think there's two realities. Uh, number one, if you're going in as a leader and you know you've done it one way for many times and you're just like, oh, this is table stakes, like this is how we do global job levels, be ready that a founder <laughs> um, who is disrupting a part of the economy who is not, you know, tried and true in large organizations is going to say, why would I do it that way? Um, so you have to be ready to think about you know, the answer beyond, oh, this is best practice and this is how everyone does it. It really has to come back to what are you trying to achieve? What's going on here? And like, why is this the best path forward? So kind of doing like uh, an education for yourself and an education for them. And many times I've come out with a different answer than I initially go in or a different recommendation that I than I initially go in with because of that conversation and that back and forth that you're going to get from an entrepreneur and founder. Um, and I think that goes back to like, stay flexible, stay agile. The other thing is there's very rarely patience for um, six months of talking about something and, or testing something. It really is like, get it out there, ship it. Let's get real time feedback. We'll iterate later. So also being brave 
Um, all right, this I have half your buy-in. I have half the employees buy-in. Let's get it out there. Let's see what the feedback loop is, and then we'll just redo it again. Um, so those have been some of the things that are I think are key to making um, it fun and successful for me to be in this role. And and it is different, right? So um, you know, understand what you want. I would say to people, and if that's exciting to you, then I think founder CEOs could be really great partners. Yeah, I think that that's really good advice. And I think, uh, again, the always be shipping kind of mantra, I mean, it's not just for products, it's not just for software, it's for like how you think about your role and your projects, your initiatives uh, on the HR and people side. Um, you know, for you, you mentioned when you came into NerdWallet, you had, you know, three very clear um, kind of goals set by your CEO of what he wanted you to be focusing on. And, um, you know, one of them, obviously, uh, kind of, incorporating DEIB throughout the entire organization. And when you're leading, um, when you're new and you're new and you're also leading HR transformation, which, you know, I'm sure the company's still moving towards the, the hybrid uh, and remote model. And that was still, a sh you, you know, the time you joined, that was still a, a shift that, you know, people were still probably adapting to. Um, but now you're also kind of tasked with both growth, but also growth while prioritizing uh, and centering DEIB efforts um, within that growth. And so how did you approach that? Because I think that, that it's a similar you know, parallel to how a lot of people leaders, I think, should be thinking about the role, particularly in growth mode, is like, how do you do that um, thoughtfully, intentionally, deliberately through the objectives of DEIB um, you know, beyond just kind of the top of funnel recruiting side, but really weaving it through your entire people operating system? Um, how did you approach that at NerdWallet? Yeah, it is, it's a really good topic and something I think about every day. I'll say my first principle is I don't consider DEIB separate or is a separate entity or a separate role that one person owns. To me, for it to be successful is it has to be integrated throughout the business from top to bottom and every single part of the employee experience. One of the things that I'm proud of, a year ago, we launched a formal DEI program. So it's been your anniversary. Um, and one of my goals within my people team is I wanted everybody to be thinking about this as part of their work. And now I have people when they're presenting analytics, when they're presenting their benefits recommendations to me, they're starting to just intuitively layer on that lens. And that's exactly what I wanted. And that's what I want for the whole organization. So that first principle is like, I believe that it should be integrated throughout the business, thought about by every single person that's at the organization. One of the things that you said, though, is we have a really great opportunity because we are in growth mode. Some larger companies, if they're not hiring, they're not significantly changing the makeup of their workforce, then it's really hard for them to make you know, significant strides in their representation. We have, I have a great opportunity because I knew that we were going to grow. Um, and there was a second part of you know, my plan, which is, how does remote first that shift there and DEI, uh, you know, link together? And I thought of that as like a really strong um, advantage for us at NerdWallet. We were willing to expand outside of the Bay Area zip codes to get talent, which I wish we would have done, you know, back in 2000 when I started in tech and I started my career. I have no idea why we limited talent and called it meritocracy when we, you know, would only pull people from a certain set of zip codes or people who were willing to move to a certain set of zip codes. That's just like anti-meritocracy <laughs> in many ways. So I knew I wanted to shift the company more to remote. And I know that expanding where we could find talent and types of talent we wanted to attract in our organization would lend itself well to us being able um, to grow in an inclusive and equitable way and shift our representation. Um, so this is, you know, those two things have worked really hand in hand here at NerdWallet. Um, and then, I, you know, another part of this is, like you said, I did an audit from top to bottom. We had stellar processes for 
structured hiring, inclusive hiring, but we just didn't have that same investment for employees when they were all, you know, when they were nerds, when they were here and employees of nerd wallet and it wasn't anyone's fault. I think it's just the industry and the trends go towards the hiring part, like you said, and kind of forget about what happens when the person is in the door. So as part of our year one plan, we wanted to kind of even out the investment. And so most of our focus, most of our programs were for existing employees. And, and we've had a lot of great strides in just the types of maturity in the conversation. And um, in fact, you know, we have internal representation goals and we've had a positive up into the right trajectory since then. Uh, one of the key programs that we've launched and I give, you know, all the credit, of course, to my team, but we have what we call a career advancement program. And so we've taken our diverse emerging leaders and we're linking them up with a year long curriculum and year long coaching so that they can be ready for the leadership positions that I know are going to come and be available with our growth at NerdWallet. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you walking me through that and all your work at NerdWallet and in your career. I mean, it's been fascinating to kind of learn about the, uh, you know, just your career path and how that has evolved and grown. And I think particularly your perspective on, you know, working with founder CEOs and kind of moving into that first HUD time role, first time head of people role and being very kind of deliberate about what, what drives you and seeking that out as opposed to just kind of going to market and seeing what you find. So, um, Lene, I, I really enjoy learning more about your background. Uh, we wrap up every episode with a lightning round just to help the audience get to know you a little bit better. So you ready to jump in? Sure. Well, let's go for it. <laughs> All right. Uh, we always kick it off with music. So I'm checking out your, uh, Spotify or wherever you stream music playlist. Uh, who will I learn your top three artists? I am a very today's top hits Spotify listener. And right now I'm listening to all the new Beyonce, Harry Styles. And I always say that I won't turn off a Doja Cat song. Uh, so <laughs> those are kind of the repeats that I have in the today's top hits. All right. Uh, we're shifting to the screen. Uh, what was your latest binge watch on uh, streaming TV? So I actually have a flight after this and I have downloaded second season of Indian Matchmaker. Mm -hmm. I just love that show. <laughs> it is one of those reality shows that I hate to admit that I watch, but, um, you know, I, I, the, the main character, Auntie Sima is really great. I mean, I we, we all need good reality shows. I mean, that's, uh, yes. you know, it's, it's an important escape. I think, uh, <laughs> we all, that we all need these days. Um, yes. we're going to go back to careers. I know you've worked in, in finance and consulting. Obviously you're in HR now. Uh, you can't do any of those things anymore. What would you be doing? Gosh, it, let's add on. If I had a talent, like an extra <laughs> talent, I would love to be like a musician. Um, I have no musical talent whatsoever. <laughs> Uh, you know, I would like to teach. Uh, I would like to teach uh, adults, <laughs> professionals. I'm not sure I, I have the energy for small children, um, teaching small children anymore. But I think, you know, teaching a wide range of things, they can go from like photography, arts and crafts to stuff we do in HR. Um, I think that'd be really fun. Cool. And uh, Lene, last question for you. Uh, who is one HR leader who you admire and why? Yeah, I am going to give a shout out uh, to Melissa Daimler right now. So she was someone that I had the chance to work with um, at Twitter and also was my coach and mentor in my first position as head of HR at Envoy. Um, and she's also just written a book on culture that I think is super tangible and applicable for everybody, everyone right now. So I'll give the shout out to Melissa Daimler. Yeah, if she's you don't great. Know, it's uh, check her out. <laughs> yeah, uh, her book is reculturing. Uh, I definitely recommend you check it out. And she actually will also be joining me on the podcast later this season. So excited to Good. have some uh, additional Twitter alumni uh, coming Yay. on the show. So, uh, well, Anne, thanks so much for coming on, sharing your journey, sharing your experience and your wisdom, and uh, keep up the great work. All right, thank you, Lars. Thanks for having me.